All right, looks like it's about time. Dr. Brown, are you ready to get started? I am, I am. Okay. So, all right, well, um, I'll go ahead and, and start some introductions. I, um, hello everyone, good evening. My name is Corbin Campbell. I'm the Associate Dean of Academic Affairs um, at the School of Education at American University. And we are just so thrilled that you all as parents could join us this evening. Um, we just recognize how this is such a challenging time um, for, for parents, for students, um, for communities, and um, in, in so many ways. And, and, and this is really the, the reason that the School of Education has put together this web series. Um, in this COVID-19 educational time and space, we know that parents need new tools and new ideas to continue to foster and learning in an equitable and excellent way for their children. And so we're so pleased that you could join us. So we have created this web series that is every Wednesday night, specifically designed for parents um, from 7 to 8 p.m. in order to support parents in this endeavor in trying to support their kids. Um, we are so fortunate in the School of Education to have some really exceptional um, educators, leaders, um, and folks who understand, in this case, young children. We know you all are here to talk about the topic of young children. And the um, topic of the title of the talk today is Finding the Teachable Moments, Thematic Learning Made Simple for Young Children at Home. And we are so fortunate to have Dr. L. Brown with us um, today to lead this webinar. And I will say that as soon as we started in School of Education talking about this webinar series for parents, um, one of our program directors said, Dr. Brown absolutely must do this. Um, and because of her energy, knowledge, experience, um, and we know that parents, especially with young children, are grappling with how to handle this time. And so we're just so thrilled that she's willing to give this webinar um, for us and with us today. And just to give you a little bit of background, Dr. L. Brown is a faculty member um, in the Early Childhood Education Master of Arts in Teaching program um, right here um, at the School of Education at American University. I wish I could be welcoming you in person, but we've got the virtual background here. Uh, she's also the founder and CEO of Kinder Jam, uh, which is an early childhood education training enrichment and care agency. And Dr. Brown began her career as an early childhood educator in Atlanta public schools, after which she relocated to Asia and taught second grade in Japan and South Korea with the Department of Defense Education Activity. Upon her return to the United States, Dr. Brown found Kinder Jam, which grew to serve military and state department families in 11 countries and 16 states. The program was founded in response to Dr. Brown's experience as a mother parenting a young child with disabilities, and its purpose was to promote early intervention and family engagement in military communities. I will also mention that Dr. Brown authored two books and also created music and curriculum for young children, so you are just in excellent hands uh, with Dr. Brown's expertise. Um, finally, before I turn it over to Dr. Brown, I wanted to mention that um, we have uh, disabled the chat function during this webinar, um, but uh, at the end, Dr. Brown will take questions, and the best way to go through uh, those questions is to put them in the Q&A, um, which is at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So if you, um, if you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, right next to participants, you'll see a Q&A button. And along the webinar, if you have questions, you can put those questions into the Q&A, and then Dr. Brown will um, take those questions at the end. So, um, so with that, I am so happy to have you join. I hope, I know myself, I will get a great deal out of this. I also have um, three kids. Uh, my youngest is in kindergarten, so I will certainly be getting a great deal from this webinar for myself as well. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Dr. Brown. All right. Well, hello, hello, hello. Thank you, Dr. Campbell. I certainly appreciate being here, and I appreciate your introduction as well. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so that we can go ahead and get this party started. So... Before we begin, I want to go ahead and um, you know give you a little information about me, so you'll know from whom this information is coming. Um, again, I'm L. Brown, and above all, I'm a mother. 
So while I'm an early childhood educator and I'm a professor and a business owner, my my calling in life is 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 to mother my son. And in mothering my son, I actually found my passion career-wise, which is early childhood education and working with families and families of young children. Um, the reason being is because when I started my journey as a mother, I was a stay-at-home mom to um, my young son, and I was a teacher by trade, so I had the background of an educator. Um, and I was able to look at my son through the eyes of an educator. And I began to notice when he was around 18, 17, 18 months, I was noticing characteristics of developmental delays. And um, I took my concerns to his pediatrician, who didn't readily share my concerns. So I um, a little frustrated. I went home and I thought, you know, if I were in the classroom, what would I do? I would teach, evaluate, assess, refer. Well, I didn't have that infrastructure at home, so I had to create it. So I then became not only my child's mom, but I became my child's first teacher. And as his teacher, I began to learn how my child learned best. Um, In learning how my child learned best, I also was able to identify the areas that he was strongest and also the areas that he needed more support. With this information, I began my dance with service providers to find out what could I do for my child and who could help me do for my child so that he could maximize his personal potential. Well, that led me to Stanford University and um, telling them my concerns, and they decided to do a behavior assessment on my son. And at the age of four years, five months, he was diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. Now, that journey took years, years of my working with my son, years of my um, communicating my observations to service providers, and it finally culminated in this diagnosis. And I was quite excited about it because now I was able to build a village of people to help me help my son. However, it also was an aha moment. I realized that I was a teacher by trade, and I understood the language, and I understood the infrastructure, yet I still had to do all of this work to advocate for my son. And I thought, what if I didn't have that skill set? Would that have been even more of a challenge for me? So at that point, I then decided to work with families. I wanted to work with families to help increase their capacity to advocate for their children. So through the program of Kinder Jam, I gave parents an opportunity to deliberately practice with their children in teaching and learning so that they could better communicate with service providers the needs of their children. So that leads me to why I'm here with you this evening. When I have the opportunity to teach and work with parents who are teaching and working with their children, I jumped at it because I understand not only as an educator but as a parent that parents need to know and understand not only how to teach their children but also how their children learn because service providers, whether they be teachers or occupational therapists or physicians, they are with our children for a season. However, we are with our children for a lifetime, and that lifetime we serve as their first and most critical educator. So hopefully during this time I will meet my goal of introducing you to skills, strategies, and information that will help you work with your little ones at home through this pandemic season where things are really uncertain. But also beyond that, when they return to the traditional classroom setting, you'll then have skills and strategies that you can then employ to collaborate with your child's educator to move your child forward. Now, I understand during this pandemic season that we have been tasked with teaching our children at home. And I also understand that to be incredibly overwhelming, considering we still have to juggle all of our other life responsibilities. Therefore, the goal for our time together this evening is to equip you with information, skills, and strategies that will help assist you in assisting your child learning while you navigate your family's life. So let's start by outlining what we're going to talk about during this webinar, which I've entitled Finding the Teachable Moment, Thematic Learning Made Simple for Young Children at Home. 
Now, the first thing that we're going to do, we're going to discuss your role. We're going to discuss your role in the context of young children learning at home, your role as the parent and the caregiver. Then we're going to identify the ages and stages of children that comprise early childhood education, which is my area. Then we're going to seek to understand what is learning as it relates to young children. Afterwards, we're going to explore what young children need to learn and where we can find that information about what young children need to learn. After which, we will then um, explore and pinpoint the best method for teaching young children at home the things that they need to know. Then we're going to examine an effective method or approach to teaching children within the home environment. Lastly, we're going to move into the practical. So what does all that we discuss, explore, and examine actually look like in the home with your child? And then when we're done with all of that, we're going to open the floor for a question and answer period. So as it relates to the role of the parent and the caregiver, first and foremost, you don't need to turn your home into a classroom because your home is already the first and most important learning environment for the child. Last, uh, next, um, you don't have to move differently through your day because there are everyday teachable moments in your everyday activities that you do with your children. And most importantly, you don't have to become a teacher because you are already your child's first and most critical teacher. And as your role of a parent and a caregiver of a young child, you are the greatest influencer on your child's life. So that means you matter. You matter a lot. So what does that look like with the young children? And exactly what, what, what are young children? What do we categorize as young children? So in the field of early child education, young children are broken down into three areas. So we have infant and toddlers, and that's birth through third, uh, three years old. Then we have preschool, and that's three-year-old to the entry of kindergarten. Then we have school age, and school age is kindergarten to third grade. Now. For the purpose of this webinar, we're going to focus on two of the three categories. The first will be preschool, and then we'll focus on school-age children. Now, if you want to learn about our infants and toddlers, you have to come back to me later because it's really an exciting area. So when we're talking about preschool and school-age children, we're going to explore ways to engage them, and we're going to see, like, what is learning for children that age? So now when we think of learning, I want us to think of building blocks and index cards. Building blocks and index cards that we are helping our children construct and place permanently in their brain. So when we think of building blocks, we want to think of the foundation on which the children will build future learning. So if you take a building block and you lay a foundation, and then you add another building block, that's the next thing they learn. And then once they've learned that, then you're going to add another building block that will then be the next thing they learn. So we're teaching them the building blocks. Then in addition to having these building blocks, they're also going to have what we like to call index cards. So these index cards are information that's going to be placed in the brain, and that's information from which the children will pull to understand new concepts. So every experience that a child has becomes an index card that's in their brain. And what they'll do, they'll take that index card and apply it to other situations to better understand new concepts. So now, when we talk about these building blocks and index cards, as I said before, they're permanent. So once you learn something, you, you know it. It's there. It's in your brain. So because of that, it's very important that when we're working with young children that we're very conscientious and intentional about the building blocks and index cards that we're placing in their brains because they're young and they have a limited number of building blocks and index cards. So whatever we tell young children or whatever we do with young children, it becomes their facts. It becomes their truth because they don't have much to compare it to just yet. So, for instance, if we're putting in things 
children and they're learning things that are erroneous or unhealthy, it'll take a lot of new information and a lot of high-quality information to replace some of that erroneous or unhealthy information that was placed in the child's brain very early on. So with that being said, it's very important for us to know not only how to engage the children, but what children need to know. So when we talk about learning, we're going to talk about these building blocks, and we're going to talk about these index cards. So remember, the building blocks are the foundation, and the index cards are the experiences from which the children will pull. So now, what do children need to learn? Now, we could teach children everything, but we really don't have the time to do all of that. And then we also need to teach children what they need to know at particular times during their lives. So we're going to talk about things like developmental milestones and learning um, standards. So developmental milestones are used for infant and toddlers as well as preschool age children. And they're essentially checkpoints in development. It's a set of functional uh, skills or age-specific paths that children can do within a certain age range. And those things are usually broken down into four categories. And those categories are like social-emotional, language communication, cognitive, which is essentially thinking, learning, and problem-solving, as well as movement and physical development. Again, we use those developmental milestones for infants and toddlers, as well as preschool age students. Now, for our school age students, Children, we're going to focus on the learning standards. Now, with the learning standards, there are learning standards for children who are not yet school age. However, for this webinar, we're going to focus on developmental milestones because they're going to tie directly into some tools and resources that I'm going to introduce to you that you can use in your home for preschool age children. So now when we talk about our school age students and we talk about our learning standards, we're going to think of learning standards as learning goals for what children should know or be able to do at each grade level. And the categories that our learning standards are broken into are English, language arts, as well as mathematics. And our learning standards go from K all the way up to entry to college, to 12th grade. Now, with these learning standards, that is a lot of information. So the reason why it's really important for us to understand the learning standards is because when we think about teaching, a teacher doesn't wake up and say, you know what, today I think I want to teach about birds because I'm in the mood to teach about birds. Teachers walk into a classroom and they teach based on something that's bigger than their opinion or their moods for the day. They teach based on what we call objectives, the objectives that they have for their students' learning. And those objectives are based on developmental milestones and the learning standards that we're going to learn more about during this webinar. So we're going to familiarize ourselves with those two terms, and then we're going to break it down in some information on where you can find out more about those developmental milestones and learning standards. So again, developmental milestones are functional skills and age-specific tasks that most children can do at a certain age. And then learning standards are what we want children to know or we expect children to know or be able to do by a certain grade level. Now, let's look at developmental milestones first. Now, if you are looking for assistance in identifying developmental milestones, the best place to go is cdc.gov. They have a robust site that is an excellent resource for families. Now, this site is broken down with developmental milestones for children from birth to age five. It provides videos as well as pictures of what the milestone looks like and the behaviors of children. It also um, provides tools that you can use beyond um, just your teaching and learning, but also to create learning experiences. And we're going to go into those tools in the next slide. So for this learning experience, we're actually going to focus on a four-year-old. So when we focus on our four-year-old, now this is a tool that we find on that cdc.gov site. And you can see here that the developmental milestones are broken down into four areas, the ones that we spoke of earlier, social, emotional, language, communication, cognitive, which again is learning, thinking, and problem solving, 
and movement and physical development. Now, what they've done here, they've explicitly stated what these behaviors look like in children. For instance, under social emotional, it says talk about what she likes and what she's interested in. You know, she enjoys doing new things, cooperating with others. Um, for the language and communication, can say first and last name, tells stories, uses basic grammar rules. For cognitive, it says can name colors and some numbers. It says plays board games and card games and also remembers parts of the story and starts to understand time as well as use scissors. Then for movement and physical development, it tells you that they can pour and um, they can pour and cut with supervision, mashes their own food, they can catch a bouncing ball, and they can stand on, you know, one foot, all those cool things that a four-year-old can do. So it's listening here. These are some of the things that four-year-olds do in that 12-month span. So we're looking for those as parents. Now, one of the things that we're going to do with those milestones, if you look at the second page, it gives you some uh, activities that you can do that will directly – reinforce some of those stages and ages appropriate milestones for children. For instance, it says use words like first, second, and finally. And here it says that, you know, give your child toys to build imagination such as dress up, kitchen sets, and building blocks. It says use good grammar when you're talking to your children. Also, it says play make-believe with your child. So again, these are developmental milestones, and what's happened here, they've spelled out the developmental milestones for you as parents, and they've also gone one step further and told you how you can use those developmental milestones to create learning experiences for your child. Now, if you have a child between the ages of birth and five years old, and you don't get anything else from me during this time that we have together, which I know you will, but if you don't, I want you to promise me you are going to go to this site, which is cdc.gov, act early, and you are going to look at some of this information, and also you're going to pass it on to your friends because knowledge is power, and there's a lot of knowledge here that's going to help you from birth to five-year-olds on what learning should look like and some of the things that you can do to support that learning. Now, we're going to move on a bit here, and... We're going to now talk about our school-age children. So we've talked about our developmental milestones with our preschool-age students. So for what children need to know for school-age, we're going to focus on Common Core. Now, the reason why I'm going to use Common Core for this webinar is because 41 of our 50 states actually use Common Core. So there's a high probability that where you all are located, they are actually using Common Core. Now, I'm in Virginia. So we don't, we use SOL, which are the standards of learning, but they're very similar. Now, when you go to Common Core, find your Common Core at corestandards.org, there's an entire section there that's just geared to families, geared to parents, what parents should know. So in essence, just understanding that when you go to your Common Core or your SOL, the web, what your state does, it's simply just outlining, it's laying out how learning is demonstrated for students at an expected grade level. So essentially, it's demonstrate what students are expected to know for each grade level. So while it seems though um, it's a really big document, if we think about it this way, they're just goals for what a child should know at a particular grade level. Now let's see how they're broken down. So. I'm having a little trouble here with my mouth. Okay, so there are two sections in your Common Core. You have English language arts standards and you have mathematical standards. Now, you can see here that they're broken down by grade levels from kindergarten all the way to 12th grade. Mathematics, the same thing, from kindergarten all the way to second, um, to 12th grade. So you can go in and you can look and see what the standards are, what children need to be learning at any grade level from kindergarten to 12. Now, for early child education, we're going to focus on kindergarten, first, and second grade. Now, we're going to look and see what our second grade standards look like because we're going to focus on a second grader for this webinar. Now, if you see here, I've extracted some of the English language art standards, and so we have things like use information gained from illustration and words. Um, we have 
compare two or more versions of the same story, participate in collaborative conversations with diverse partners, follow agreed upon rules of discussions. Now, with your English language arts standards, those are pretty robust, so I only took out a few of them. However, with our mathematics for our second grader, I gave you an overview here that I took directly from the site, and it talks about operations and algebraic thinking, numbers and operations in base 10, measurements and data, geometry, mathematical pro practices as well. Now, that is a lot of information. However, I will be honest with you. Um, the standards do require a little more time than the developmental milestones to comb through. However, they're not a difficult read, and it is very well worth your time to go through and look at those standards. One, because while you have your children at home, it will show you what children are expected to know during their grade level, but it will also work with you beyond the pandemic season, so you'll have a framework for what your child is to learn at any grade level they are in beyond, you know, present time. Now, we have those developmental milestones, and we have those learning standards, and now we're going to put them together, and we're going to talk about how do we teach. Now, the reason why I started you with so much information from the beginning is because when we are teaching our children, we have to teach children a certain way in order to maximize this experience. And the way we teach children is contextually. And what contextually means is that we're going to use the experiences and the surroundings, and we're going to use their environment, and we're going to teach things that are relevant to the children. We're going to use their ideas and such. So with that, it's important for us to first know what children are going to need to know or what they need to learn at a particular age and stage because that will then help us create learning experiences that are contextual. Instead of picking a skill and a strategy and then teaching that, we're going to teach from a place of the environment based on the child's interest because our goal in teaching is to assist and support child, or child's learning through mediums that are relevant to the children. So with that said, within our environment and our child's interest, we are going to find what we call teachable moments. Now, these teachable moments are events and experiences in your everyday life that present good opportunity for learning. Now, also, these are times when learning is easiest for children because their brains are open and receptive to learning. So we're going to go with the flow, and we're going to let this happen organically and within the context of family activities. Now, I understand that this is the antithesis of what we commonly think about when we envision parents working with children academically. We generally think about, you know, we have an assignment, and we have to get that assignment done. That assignment then becomes a task as opposed to a learning experience. Now, what we want to do, we want to create learning experiences because positive learning experiences lead and produce, lead to and produce positive learning outcomes. Now, also, they're easier and they're more time efficient and enjoyable for the family to create these learning experiences as opposed to trying to execute and finish these tasks that are based on one skill, two skill, three skill. Now, now that you know what your child is expected to learn and you know where to find this information, additionally, your teachers will supply you with information that they'll send home um, about the outlines, what the children are expected to learn. But now we're going to learn how to teach the children contextually utilizing these teachable moments. Now, what does that look like? So what that looks like is an approach that we call thematic learning. So thematic learning is essentially addressing an array of skills under one topic. So you have your milestones, you have your standards, they're telling you what children are expected to know at various ages and stages. Now, instead of picking one or two things and working on that one or two things and then choosing another one or two things and working on those one or two things, what thematic learning enables you to do is group those things together and teach them under one umbrella topic. 
Now, the benefits of thematic teaching is that it allows learning to be more natural, natural and less fragmented. Also, it's more time efficient. Um, the children are actively involved because you're working with their environment and you're also utilizing some of their interests. And it also makes teaching more fun and less hard work. Because, again, we recognize that you already have so many tasks to complete throughout your day just in navigating the responsibilities of family life. So we don't necessarily want teaching to feel like hard work. We really do want it to be an enjoyable experience. But most importantly, with a theme, a theme can be used for multiple ages and multiple stages of development. So what that means is that you could have a four-year-old and a second grader in the same house and you can use one theme to teach both children. You're going to identify the developmental milestones that you need for your four-year-old, and you're going to identify the learning standards that your uh, second grader needs to meet. And with that, you are going to bring them together, and you're going to have some type of activity under a theme that's going to touch on several of those standards and touch on several of those milestones. Now, how do we use themes to teach? So what I'm going to do here, we're going to look at a theme of cooking. So I'm going to use the theme cooking here. And because we reviewed the four-year-old and we've also reviewed the second grader, we're going to put them together and we're going to pretend that we're in a household with a four-year-old as well as a second grader. And what we're going to do, we're going to use the theme of cooking to address some of those developmental milestones and address some of those learning standards. So with our four-year-old, we are in the kitchen, and we're going to have our four-year-old pretend to be a chef. We're going to pretend to be a chef because then we're going to talk about that imagination building and that, that make-believe play. Then we're going to take turns with the siblings, stirring some of the ingredients that we're using for whatever we're baking or cooking. That then leads into that cooperative play that we want to focus on, as well as, you know, learning to work with others because children enjoy working in social environments. Then we're going to narrate the cooking procedures. You know, first we're going to do this, then we're going to do this, next we're going to do this. That then goes back to some of the teachable experiences that we talked about on the cdc.gov handout, where we're going to use words like first, then, and finally with our children, because that not only helps them in language, but it also helps them in literacy when they're telling stories and such. Then we're going to use some of those identification of colors with the ingredients. You know, the tomato is red, the bell pepper is green, the onion is white. Then we're going to use some of our fine motor skills with supervision, and we're going to do some pouring and some cutting. Now, when my son was a preschooler, I had like a lettuce knife that I used. So the blade wasn't sharp, but he could stand next to me, and together we could cut vegetables when we were cooking. Um, also, you're going to use the things like we said, using scissors at four years old. So you're going to make a cut and paste menu. So if you're making turkey casserole, you're going to print from the internet a picture of turkey casserole. You may have your little one cut out the picture of the turkey casserole, glue it to a piece of paper, and make a menu for the family to show them what we're going to be eating for dinner. Then we can have our little one talk about their likes and dislikes, you know, what do they like about turkey casserole or what they don't like about turkey casserole or what they like about the, the cooking experience or what they didn't like about the cooking experience. Then it also gives us an opportunity to discuss healthy food options. You know, what are some foods that we should choose to eat? What are some foods that we should only eat sometimes? Then you can also have your four-year-old draw a picture about the activity that you just did, and then that child can explain the picture so that they can tell the story that the picture illustrates. And also because children who are young and children who are older, they love singing. So you can sing cooking songs on top of spaghetti while you're cooking, or you can make up songs. Children love to make up songs and chants that you can then use while you're cooking. Now, you have a second grader who's also in the kitchen with you. So with your second grader, you're doing these things simultaneously. So your second grader, you're going to work on some little higher order skills that are going to touch on to some of those learning standards that we address in second grade Common Core. So when the reading, we're going to print out that recipe, 
and we're going to read it with our child. So we're going to have our child read aloud, and we're going to practice some of those reading skills. Then when your child comes to a word that he or she doesn't understand, we're going to talk about what that word means. That then leads into vocabulary. Now we have language. One of the things that we're focusing on in second grade are the who, what, when, where, and why type questions. So give your child the opportunity to converse with you while you're cooking so they can ask questions, and you can then answer questions. You can help them rephrase you know, questions so that they are more easily understood to a listener that will then give them a better opportunity for giving the answers that they seek from their questions. Then when you talk about math, when we look at the math for the second grade, we saw things like measurement. So we can look at measurement in volume when we're measuring liquids when we're cooking. We can also look at measurement in the sense of time, time lapse. We put the casserole in at 1230. It has to cook for an hour. What time should we open the oven and take it out? You're also going to talk about science. You talk about those properties. Was it one property when you put it in the oven and another property when you took it out? And then we can talk about reasoning. Let's say you have a casserole here and you have four members of your family. You know, how do we divide this casserole to ensure that everyone has an equal part? Now, from there, you can move into something like social justice. Now, just because everyone can get an equal part, does everyone need an equal part? Perhaps someone has an appetite that may be larger than someone else. But also in social justice, we can then talk about food insecurity. That's one of the things that you can address for a second grader that they'll understand. Like, not everyone has the resources in their homes to make a turkey casserole. So we can then talk about things like what other families may be experiencing during this pandemic season who may be in households that aren't as resource friendly. Then we can talk about writing, because when we're talking about second graders, there are really three types of writing you have. You have a narrative, you have opinion pieces, and then you also have it uh, like nonfiction fact-based. So with that, they could do a nonfiction on telling you the steps that they use in the cooking. They can have a narrative where they've made a story about their cooking. They can have an opinion piece where they talk about their likes and dislikes in the cooking experience or the food that was uh, subsequently prepared from the cooking experience. And then we can go into social science where we talk about culture. Is this a particular at, um, food that is used or eaten within your culture quite often? If so, talk about some of your experiences with this food as a child. If not, you know, what culture is this food representative of? Then you can get into geography. Okay, so this food is representative of this culture. Does this culture indicative of a certain place in the world? If so, let's find it on the map. Let's Google it and see where that location is. But most importantly, teaching with a theme in your home, you're going to touch on social emotional. So social emotional means you're going to touch on the warm fuzzies and the feelings, the things that we use for children to help them to develop into good people. Not only is it a learning experience, but it's a bonding experience. Now during this uncertain time, you've just shared this moment with your child, and in this moment you have secured that bond by reassuring your child that while things are uncertain, certain in the world, right here in the home, you have me, I have you, we have each other, and we're able to have these wonderful experiences with each other. Now, the reason why I love using themes to teach is because, again, you guys are busy. You're busy teaching, and now you cook the meal for your family in addition to being busy teaching and also all the other things that you have to do, but now you've taught for the day, you've handled it like a boss. Class is dismissed, and boom, you're done for today. So now the next day you can move on to another theme or you can revisit cooking. So what we'll talk about now are some of the themes that are commonly used in preschool and school-age uh, classrooms that can easily be done in the home. Now for preschoolers, we have cooking and baking, like we just talked about. We have being healthy. We kind of touched on that when we talked about good food choices. We have board games and card games, celebrations and traditions, caring for pets, all about me, my family, five senses. Those are all things that you can use, the things that you have around your house every day to teach under that one topic and touch on so many different developmental milestones. Now, when you have a school-age child, you can do some of those same things, but we're just going to take it up a notch. 
So with your school age child, you can do cooking and baking, but as I illustrated before, you're going to work on what the learning standards are that can be addressed during that activity. And now while we talk about being healthy with a preschooler, we're going to talk about nutrition with our school age child. Now with our board games and card games, now with our preschool school age child, the family may play Candyland. With our school age child, we may touch on the game of life. My son and I just played that like two days ago. And now with the new person, they have wonderful talking points or questions for the participants on each of the cards, which gives a great opportunity for that language development. You can touch on family traditions. You know, you're going to have birthdays and celebrations that you're not able to do in the traditional sense, but you can talk about the traditions that you have. Then you have citizenship. Now, if you notice for our preschool age child, we focused on one task, and that was the caring for the pet, and we're going to teach within the context of that. However, for our school age child, we took it up a notch. So we're going to talk about chores in general. We're going to talk about contributions, so citizenship, playing your part, doing your part. Then with our preschool age child, we talked about all of about me and my family. But with our school age child, we're going to take it up a notch and we're going to talk about my neighborhood. So as you're walking through the neighborhood, we're going to talk about the components of your community, what makes your neighborhood. Then with our school age children, we can even enjoy something like a movie. We can take a movie that we can watch with our child and we can talk about the movie's art, the beginning, middle, and end. We can talk about the plot, the main idea, the moral. Of the story. We can identify characters. We can identify settings. So all those things can be done right at home. Also, while we're at home, we're using all these different things. So another really popular one with school-aged children are inventors and inventions. Now, everything that we use comes from somewhere. So we can take time to kind of figure out, you know, what is the engineer and who made this and all the different things that we use, understanding that someone made a contribution to make those things possible for our usage. Now, those are all things that you can be you can use in your house. Now, however, consider asking your child about their interests and working within a topic that they suggested. Because again, remember, we want to work in a place that's optimal for learning, which is in our environment and with a child's interest. So your children may come up with things that I've not touched on. Also, you know your environment best, you know your child best, and you also know your time best. So again, you're going to select the theme that works in your everyday family activities. Now, with that said, we are going to talk about the bottom line here. So bottom line thing, use your environment. Your environment is your home. Your home, your neighborhood, that is your child's first classroom. So you're going to use the things that are within your home environment, within your community environment, to teach your children. It's not necessary for you to go out and buy new things. If you take time to look around your home with an intentional eye, you will see so many opportunities for learning. Now, we want to think about about two hours a day. When you are instructing children, try to limit it to about two hours a day. Now, remember, those are not those are non-linear instructional hours. So two hours a day doesn't necessarily mean that you're sitting down for two hours or you're, you're embarking on this project for two hours. It could mean 15 minutes here, 20 minutes here, 10 minutes here, the 30-minute walk that you took. So again, but you want to do about two hours a day. You really don't want to go over that. That's 10 hours a week. That's actually more than they may get in a lot of classrooms with one teacher and 24 kids. Then you also want to follow the child's interest. So even though you're going to work with some of the themes that I provided for you here, you're also going to ask your child, you know, what would you like to learn about? And if it's dinosaurs, you can find a way to do all this in the context of dinosaurs. You can find how to do all of this in the context of woodwork, if that's something that someone in your family enjoys doing. So, again, find an interest that your child has and something that is within your environment. Also, familiarize yourself with the milestones and the standards. Now, I know I spent quite a bit of time on those, but please understand that I can teach a entire semester on milestones and standards. So I gave you kind of like a down and dirty quick preview of them. And I really would like you all to go to corestandards.org and um, cdc.gov act early to familiarize yourself with these milestones and standards. The reason being, 
it is impossible to teach if you don't have a direction in which to go. So essentially, these milestones and standards are going to tell you the direction in which to teach your child. So when you familiarize yourself with this, you can then do purposeful planning. You can then see educational opportunities all around you because you're working with what a four-year-old needs to know. You're working with what a second grader needs to understand and be able to do. Now, also, I want you to try to go with the flow. I know that is sometimes we want to have things done a certain type of way, but right now flexibility is very important. We are in uncertain times. Things are happening. We don't need you getting stressed out. This is not something where we want you to stress out. We want this to happen organically. We want this to be fun. We want this to be something that you look forward to doing with your child each day. Now, with that, be gentle with yourself. Things happen. We don't always get it right the first time. You can cook with your children. It could be a disaster the first time around, but that's okay. There is a lesson in that disaster. That disaster. Learn the lesson. Embrace the moment. Be gentle with yourself. Laugh at yourself. Laugh with your children because it is so important to have fun. Now, when you do all of these things with your children, I want you to think about, I am enjoying my child. This is something that is fun to do. Because remember, learning should be fun. And teaching your child should be like breathing to you. Just let it come natural. You are already your child's first, favorite, and most loved teacher. Times are uncertain right now. But you already have everything you need to do this. So be easy on yourself and understand that you got this. Now, tomorrow, you're going to go in there. You're going to enjoy your child. You're going to enjoy this valuable gift of family time. And remember, you are already first and favorite. Child, that's already your number one fan. Have fun. Be easy on yourself. Use themes. Touch on those developmental milestones. Touch on those standards. Follow the children's interests. And most importantly, go with the flow. Go with the flow and have fun. Now, I have given you so much information, and all of the information was information that I felt you should know. However, I want to take an opportunity now to talk about some of the things that you want to know. So I want to open up the floor for questions. So I'm going to unshare my screen and give you all the opportunity to answer the questions in the question and answer. And I'm going to follow Dr. Campbell's lead as we go through our question and answer period. Wonderful. Dr. Brown, I just want to thank you so very deeply much. I think the questions are going to, I'm just going to come on here while we're waiting for the questions to start to queue up. Um, but I wanted to just tell you personally um, how much I, I just deeply appreciated your talk. And I know I will take so much from the thematic um, conversation into my own daily parenting with my kids as well. I have a kindergartner and a third grader as well. And just... Oh. Yes, thank you. And a, and a fifth grader. So we didn't get to there, but the, but you know, just watching you sort of parallel, you know, thinking about what my kindergartner would be doing and what my third grader would be doing, and it was just so helpful. And I know our panelists. I, I will also say, uh, I know our attendees are finding this useful as well. A few folks had asked whether um, this would this uh, webinar would be available later um, in a recording format. And yes, we are recording. So uh, we will be able to post that for those who want to forward this on to others as well. And I see the uh, Q&As are coming in. So Dr. Brown, I'll give okay. you a chance to start. Do you, do you, can you see the Q&As? I just want to. I can. And actually, I like the Q&As better because with that um, talking, I felt like I was talking to myself. So I was kind of like, <laughs> trying to find my momentum, but now I'm working with real people. Okay, what if your child is not meeting the developmental milestones? What should you do? Boom. The first thing you should do is go to the cdc.gov website. If you notice there on the side, it says, if your child isn't doing X, Y, and Z. It tells you 
to go to your physician. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to tell you to do something a little different. I'm going to tell you if you feel like your child is not meeting the developmental milestones as listed on that document, I'm going to say do not hesitate to call early intervention. Call child fine, reach out to an early interventionist. The reason being early interventionists are allies for parents. So they will hold your hand and they will walk you through the process. Early interventionists also come into the home or they come directly into the child's learning environment so they can see the child operating in a context that is most relevant to the child. Whereas if you go to the physician, they're going to see them within the context of a doctor's office. So that's not necessarily the best place for a child to illustrate their strengths in the areas where they need additional support. However, if you partner with early intervention, and that is between, um, that window is birth to 36 months. So as soon as you notice anything, do not hesitate. Contact early intervention in every state and every territory, has, and even military um, installations overseas have early intervention offices. I hope that answers that question. Now, the next question is, this is a lot of great information and a lot to process. Where should I get started as a parent? Um, that depends on the age and stage of your child. If you have a, a preschooler, I would say go, I'm going to keep pushing you back to the cdc.gov website. I'm going to say find your child's age, go to the cdc.gov uh, website, and then I want you to kind of see what can you easily do in your home right now. Now, if your child's teacher has sent home a packet, you can you have a school-age child, she's already working within the learning standards, so you can look at that packet and say, okay, well, they want us to do math, and this is what she's having us do. She has us working on uh addition and subtraction. So you can then think about what are some ways that you can do addition and subtraction in your everyday activity. Again, you want to, while it's a lot of information, you want to break it into chunks, but always your first step is going to go to what a child needs to know. And the reason why we do that is because if not, we could potentially end up teaching kids things that may be three steps ahead. And um, when we think about that, we're now operating outside of their zone of proximal development, and that can then um, be a place for contention and frustration in learning. And then it begins to feel like a task. And it feels like a task because we're teaching a child something that they're not yet ready to learn because they haven't gotten the building blocks that they need in order to ease into that learning experience. Um, let's see. Next question here. How does discipline play into teaching and learning? It's really hard, and there are some power struggles and behaviors that are atypical for my kids, and it's frustrating for us all. How can I set them up for success? Okay, now when we talk about discipline, one, I like the word guidance. We want to use guidance and management. And one of the ways to circumvent what might be considered discipline problems is engagement. So when I talked about operating a child's interest, so that child's interest might be opposite of what we are trying to introduce to the child. So when that happens, you know, as adults, think about if you're in a staff meeting, they're talking about something you have no interest in, what do you do? You talk to your neighbor, you're acting out. That's an adult form of acting out. So when we work with children, then if you notice that you're having issues when it comes to managing children during an educational situation, you know, stop the situation and have a conversation with your child. Say, okay, this isn't working. What can we do to make this work better? Okay, so however I am introducing this information to you right now isn't working. So help mommy, or see, I'm talking, help me. <laughs> Help me figure out a way that works best for you. Because the difference between you and the home and a classroom teacher, a classroom teacher has all of these personalities to manage while she's giving an instruction. Your ratio is so in your favor because you have one, two, three children. So work with that individual child and see how can you make learning relevant for that child so it becomes a fun experience. It may be something that's computer-based. It may be something that's outdoors. Whatever it is, work with that one child and make it individual to him. Um, that's something that I would 
also like to talk to a parent after they tried something, and then we would kind of um, see if this worked, and if it didn't work, then we would try another skill or strategy. So that one isn't a one quick answer. That's a try, see if it works, and then see what didn't work, what did work, and then we would kind of tailor it for that child. Okay, next one. Um, what is the webinar website so we can listen to this again, please? Thank you so much. Uh oh, well, I'm sure Dr. Campbell will um, provide you all with that information. I'm so glad that you got some information from this. It was wonderful and inspiring. I like those words. Okay, I have a two-year-old grandson that has been diagnosed as being on the spectrum for autism, delayed speaking. Where do I go from here in teaching and learning? Okay, so if you have a two-year-old grandson who has been diagnosed, then you are already linked into early intervention services, I am assuming. Um, I will direct you directly to your early interventionist. The reason being is that she is someone who can come into the home, she can come into the learning environment, she can get to know your child. You can then ask her direct questions about that child's learning and the environments that that child goes into. And that early interventionist not only will be able to assist you with the wealth of knowledge that she has, she will also be able to link you in with service providers and services in your area that will work best for that child. I cannot say enough, early intervention, early intervention, early intervention. Early interventionists are angels in my eyes. Um, I hope that answers your question. Oh, thank you, Dr. Parker. <laughs> so thanks, this was great. I'm a teacher and a parent of two young children, but it's challenging to do both right now. Oh, I understand that. You gave me some great ideas moving forward. Wonderful, all right. Um, what are your thoughts about Sesame Street, just letting children watch learning shows on TV? What are the best shows to let them watch? First of all, I am a huge fan of Sesame Street. With that, I'll say I'm also a huge fan of parent engagement. Um, I don't believe that a child should be watching any program alone. That's because I believe in teachable moments. When you are watching a program with your child, two things are happening. One, you're being able to, you are able to see the building blocks and the index cards that are being placed in your child's brain. And two, you are then able to expand on the information that's being presented in that television show. So um, with Sesame Street, for the most part, I've not ever encountered something on Sesame Street that gave me pause. So I, I, I love Sesame Street. However, with some of the other channels that are a little more commercial, um, I would first watch the show and then um, give it to my child to watch. Again, so you'll be aware of those building blocks and index cards that's being inserted into your child's brain. Um, School-age kids, not quite sure what that question is. Um, Let's see, any recommendation for middle school children that have shown signs of missing milestones but have not been diagnosed? Um, standardized academic testing has often been right. Mm. So middle grades is outside of my area of expertise, but I will tell you, um, if you, if your child has not been diagnosed and you have um, concerns, I would definitely bring that to the school um, and ask for an assessment. Um, if an assessment has already been offered, um, advocate. Advocate, advocate, advocate. Um, sometimes it is about, as parents, we are the expert on our children, and we know our children best. So if you are not getting the answer that you feel your child deserves to help them meet their um, their personal potential or maximize their personal potential, keep pushing. Don't take no for an answer. Don't ever take no for an answer. You're the expert when it comes to your baby, whether your baby is 2, 22, or in the eighth grade. Can you share how we can continue to connect and check in with our school community? Um, that varies from district to district. One of the things that I really, really uh, 
in Joy now, many schools have family engagement liaisons. So that would be your first point of contact. So see if your school has a family engagement liaison. If your school does have a family engagement liaison, that will then tell you that that school is, is working ahead of the power curve when it comes to getting families involved in the school environment. And when I talk about engagement, I'm talking about what you do with the school and not necessarily what you do for the school. I see Dr. Campbell, so I guess the time is short. I hope that answered your question, Latanya. Dr. Brown, I just, I wanna thank you so much, uh, both for your presentation, your wonderful style, the informative, um, just the information you've uh, given us all today, and also all of your um, on the spot answers to these deep questions. I also wanna thank the participants for being so engaged in this conversation um, as care, deeply caring parents and caregivers. Um, and, um, and I know that we will all leave today feeling inspired for how to um, help our children learn in our everyday environments through um, these thematic elements. Mm -hmm. So, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Brown. I also uh, wanted to mention that next week, uh, if you have enjoyed this webinar, I hope that you all will be able to join us next week, same time, same day. Uh, Dr. Carolyn Parker will be discussing science learning um, uh, during COVID times with your children. And so, um, as you can imagine, uh, there's so much learning that can happen. A science learning that can happen during this time and I am I do worry that uh, science often gets left off the table sadly in COVID um, conversation uh, many uh, especially for kids um, and um, and so so we'll really look forward to joining you next week with Dr. Parker to discuss um, science learning I hope you all have a wonderful week and thank you again Dr. Brown and thank you again to parents and caregivers for caring so deeply about your own kids and students take care everyone Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Right. Bye.